Jesus, sorry I'm late. Work was crazy today. No, don't get up. It's okay. Uh, yeah, just got a little bit behind. People are being crazy, you know. That's no problem, Chuck. I'm just glad. Uh, I'm glad I made it too. Listen, let's get down to business. I have a lot of work here. A lot of requests. First things first, pastor and his wife are at a conference. Keep them safe. Um, but, uh, I'm not a fan of the assistant pastor. The less he preaches, the better. Uh, what else? Ralph, his wife, is getting a tattoo removed. It's a stupid college party way back when. You know how those things go. It's in a real painful spot. I'm not a fan of football here, but my friend is. And if I could have two tickets to take him to show him how cool I am so he'd be my friend some more, that'd be great. My dog Nibbles has a gimp leg. Chimney crickets. You know, now that I'm thinking, I could use a new jacket. I'm getting fuzzies all in this one. Please bless my sister, my mother, my father. Our father who art in heaven. My neighbor, Cindy. Hallowed be thy name. Can you sort of train my church to clap on two and four, please? One and three, this is not disco, people. This is serving the Lord. The guy who brings in my shopping cart from the thing. Something I can do to get a raise. Can you read what I wrote here? I think I was, I was dreaming. Plus the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Agriculture, the Secretary of Secretaries. Bless their secretaries. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come. And that's what bothers me about my mother. Hey, look at the time there. That's, uh, it's, uh, gotta get going there. Jesus gonna wrap this up and say amen. Amen. Uh, it's been a pleasure praying with you. It's fine evening. I'll be talking with you. Have a good day. Some of us pray like the guy in the video, right? I mean, he's kind of talking out loud to Jesus as he's sitting at a table at a coffee shop. But we kind of, I mean, you know, mumble and we think about 19 other things that should be going on. And we start, you know, kind of coming up with things to pray for because we're kind of running out of things to pray for. So that's when we start praying, you know, for our dog and, and uh, kind of random things. That is sadly funny because it's so true in how we often pray. In fact, let, let me suggest that to most people, God is not a personal being. He is an idea. To most of us, when we, when we talk about prayer or when we talk about believing in God or loving God, and we've talked about this a little bit in our small groups this week, God is really just an idea more than a personal being whom we are in relationship with. And if that is the case, then our prayer life begins to look like this because we believe in God and we do the prayer thing because we think we ought to because the pastor said to, because you're checking something off of your box, but you're not necessarily connecting to the creator of the universe that wants to have a, a relationship with you. In fact, the process kind of goes like this. We believe in the idea of God or of a God, but we don't have a relationship with him. So, when we, so, so then that means we go to him and pray when we're in need, right? Not a daily, regular conversation. We go to God and we pray when we're in need, but he doesn't answer because we really don't believe in him. We just believe in the idea of him. And then because he didn't answer, God remains only an idea because we never really experienced his presence. We never experienced his answer. And so what I want to do this morning, we're, we're going to have the next two weeks, to this week and next week, we're going to talk a little bit about prayer. And what I want to talk about this morning really is just the idea of plugging in to God's power, plugging in to his love, plugging into the source of our strength so that we don't view God as Santa Claus 
someone to give us what we need when we need it. And so we don't view God as just an idea that because we're almost kind of in the South, but not really, and we have some idea of church because we went to church when we were five, that then somehow we must believe in God, but we don't live it in our daily lives. We simply think about it when someone says, do you go to church? You say, oh yeah, you know, I, I've been a Christian. I believe God's, he's great, you know, God's been good to me. And we start talking like that. And, and the, the reality is oftentimes we talk like that, we hadn't even thought about God, you know, for months. But there is a real God who is the real creator of the real universe who wants a real relationship with real people, and that includes you. And that's what we want to talk about this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning that you are real. We thank you that when we come into this place, God, you have something for us. You're not just a character in a story in a book that we come and we talk about on Sunday morning, but you are a God who created everything. You're a creative God who created us as tools and as masterpieces, and you want to help us see who we were really created to be. God, open our hearts and minds this morning. Challenge us, God. Challenge us, challenge us to go to a new place and a new level in our relationship with you so that we can truly experience you in our lives in a real way. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I want to start this morning. If you have a Bible, please open it to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible and you would like to follow along, please raise your hand and we'll bring one to you. And if you take a Bible and you have one at home, you can turn yours back in at the end of the service. And if you don't have one at home, take it with you. It's our gift. All right. So here, Paul is writing a letter to the Ephesians. And he's, in this particular letter, it's, it's almost less instructional. Like, hey, don't, don't uh, do these things and don't do these things. He has that in some of his letters, especially in the book of Corinthians, a lot of teaching and instructional stuff. But in the book of Ephesians, Paul talks more about what salvation and what God is all about. He talks about the fact that we were created as masterpieces, created for a purpose to do his good works. He talks about how the Jews and the Gentiles are no longer separated, but through Christ's death, they've now been brought together. There's no longer Jew or Gentile or Greek or male or female. We're all equal in God's eyes. He talks about how we are now, as followers of Christ, we are now brothers, literally brothers, adopted brothers to Jesus, the Son, and that we have his inheritance as a result of our salvation because we're now children of God. We've been adopted into his family. So in this particular case, listen to the prayer at the end of the first chapter that Paul prays for the Ephesians because I think there's some important things in there that will help you to understand what God wanted for us because of how Paul prayed for us. So we're going to begin in verse, uh, verse 15. He says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. He says, I, I pray also that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. What's that power like? That power is like the working of his spirit, the working of his power, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority and power, dominion and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. That doesn't sound like the God who is an idea to me. Paul prays for us to have 
a relationship with Jesus that is a little different, quite frankly, than most of us imagine a relationship with Jesus looks like. What did he pray for here? In verse 17, He wants us to know him better. Paul prays that we would have that spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we would know God better. Most of us, guys, most of us don't think of our relationship with God as us knowing him like we know a person, like we know our spouse, like we know our our friends, like we know our parents. But Paul says he prays that we would have God's Spirit in our lives so that we would know Him. Not just know about Him, but know Him better. In verse 18, he talks about the hope to which we were called. And he says that hope is the riches of His inheritance in the saints or among God's people. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that God created everything wonderful in the universe and because we were born here on this planet, we get to have all this good stuff. No, what it says is that when we follow Jesus, when we're accepting his salvation, we're we're adopted into his family, we have the inheritance of the riches of God. It's now our inheritance. In verse 19, he extends the inheritance part to say he wants us to know the incredibly great power that is available to us. And how does he describe the power? This, is, this may be one of my favorite portions in all of Scripture. How does he describe the power? It is like the working of his mighty strength. Okay, this is God. He created the universe. So when it says mighty strength, we're not talking about a guy in the Olympic Games who's lifting a bar, you know, because he's got a lot of strength. This is different. He lifts planets and black holes, not barbells, okay? His mighty strength is big. And then he goes on to give us a picture that we can understand a little bit better of how powerful it is. And I think he wants to stretch our faith just a little bit. He says it's like the strength that he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. I suggest that most of you here today say you believe in the power of a supernatural God. But we're practical atheists. We say we believe it, but few of us really believe that we have available to us the power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead. So let that sink in a minute. Now I want to take you over to our main text, and what we're about to read is the second prayer that Paul prays for the Ephesians. There are two prayers that he prays for the Ephesians in the book of Ephesians. This one's over in, in chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 16 through 21. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, sound familiar? Glorious riches? Out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power. Power again, sound familiar? With power, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, each of you individually, being rooted and established in love, now, he says, together. I pray that you individually, together, with all of the other believers, all the saints. You may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge. 
that you may be filled to the full measure with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. We can close the doxology there. When we look at the second prayer, we see two, I, I think there are two primary things that we see in the text. He talks about a special kind of power. And he talks about a special kind of love. And I think Paul prays this for the Ephesians. Why? Because he knows they don't get this. And it gets penned. God makes sure it ends up in his holy book as his word. Why? Because he knows we probably don't get this. He's talking about power and love. The first one we talk about here is power. And we know what power means, right? Because we just read about it in his first prayer. And so I'm going to call it resurrection power, okay? That's the, the simplest way I know to describe it so that you can understand how powerful it is. Resurrection power is the power God used to raise Christ from the dead and it's available to us. The, the next thing I want to point out here as he's talking about the concept of power, he's giving us an idea of how we get it. He's giving us an idea of who he wants us to be and how he wants us to live and how it all works. He says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power. How? Through his spirit in your inner being. If you don't have his spirit, you don't have his power. I pray that you have this power through his spirit in your inner being so that... Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. One thing I would point out in this, you have to remember that Paul is writing to who? The church, right? The church. And in fact, a little bit more information about this letter. We believe that Paul actually wrote this letter to circulate among multiple churches that he created. So this is, it. this is big stuff. He wasn't just writing it as, a, as an admonition or a teaching to one church. This was to the churches in the Mediterranean. So here, he says he prays that we would have power through his spirit in our inner being. That's right here. All right, nothing we can do on the outside. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. If he's talking to the church, you, you might say, wait a minute. I, I thought if I became a believer that Christ was dwelling in my hearts. Why is it then that he's talking to believers and saying, I pray that Christ would dwell in your hearts? You, you see, this is not the only place. There's a number of places in the New Testament where we realize that there is a, somehow a greater filling of God's Spirit in our life. He is present. His Spirit is present in us. But to the level that we allow His Spirit to work and permeate our lives, we won't actually be full of His Spirit. It doesn't flow out of us. So think about this for a moment. Sometimes we pray to be filled with God's Spirit. I like to think of it like this. Fill me with your Spirit, God, so that it will overflow. Think of a cup. You're pouring the Spirit into that cup. And eventually, it overflows. And what happens to everything around that cup? It gets wet. So if God's Spirit is in your life and you are praying and walking with God, walking in His Spirit, and His Spirit is so full in your life that it begins to overflow, it's going to do what? It's going to touch everything and everyone around you. So there is a difference between being born again into a new life in Christ and having God's Spirit come to reside in you and then being full of His Spirit as you work out your salvation through prayer and Scripture reading and getting to know God. Okay? Here's one of the things that I think is a beautiful picture. The word dwell here. So it says so that Christ can dwell in our hearts through faith. The way this word is is worded in the Greek 
text, and I don't like to go too much into that, but it's actually a little bit more powerful than just dwell. One of the words, the simpler form, really means basically set up a tent, spend the night, you know. This one actually means a little bit more of to make yourself at home, to make this the place where I live, to get comfortable in it. So he wants us to have him in our lives in such a way that he is making himself comfortable in our home, in the home where he dwells in our hearts. So I, I was, um, a couple years ago, it's been too many years, like eight years ago, I moved into a house in North Carolina where we had an unfinished upstairs, and it was like raw unfinished. It had a floor in it, and that was it. And so I, because I've got some, I'm fairly handy and stuff like that, uh, I decided to take on the job of building the entire second story of our house, which I did and had two rooms and a and, uh, bathroom and all this good stuff. And I, somebody had given me some blueprints for the house, which is great because that probably costs a lot of money, and somebody gave them to me. And what I realized was I didn't really want it quite the way the blueprints called for it. They had, you know, two bedrooms, and I, I didn't need six bedrooms in my house, you know, all these little tiny bedrooms. What I thought was, you know, let's, let's have one of them as a bedroom, and then let's make the other one just kind of a bonus room. So let's leave off the closets and leave off the, the hall, you know, and just kind of leave it as one big open space. And then on the other side, there's this, there's this closet that goes from like here, like 20 feet down, and it's about that deep, you know? And I thought, I don't need a 20-foot-long closet that's two feet deep, but, you know, eight feet would be fine, right? So, so what I did was I, I took these plans and I got some ideas of how it was, how they expected it or somebody else wanted it to be. But instead, when I built this thing, I built it to suit me. I, I built it to fit my family and the things that we do and the things that we like. I made myself at home. And I, and I believe that that's what Jesus wants. That's what Paul is praying. He's praying that God's spirit, that power would be made alive in our life so that we would empty ourselves enough to allow Jesus to make us to suit him like he wants us to be, not like our plans called for, right? Hey, uh, Levi, can you bring that up here? So, I get excited about building stuff, okay? And that's kind of a guy thing. Not everybody does it. But I, I like to build stuff, and, and I think that there's something biblical about that. You remember David after all the wars, and he's kind of getting old and stuff like that. So David says, David says, um, I want to build the temple now, Lord. But he doesn't. God says, no, I, I, want, I, want, um, I want your son to do it. I want Solomon to build the temple. Solomon's the right person for the job. But here's the interesting thing. It took Solomon like eight years to build the temple. I think he had the building bug. I mean, there's all these details in the Bible that if you're reading through the Bible, you're kind of like, and this shall be like, you know, 14 yarns of purple stuff and, you know, the drapes were this long and you had these gold things hammered into flowers and you kind of get bored and sleepy as you're reading through it because it doesn't necessarily add a lot. But somebody thought this building stuff was really important, right? And, and then... The interesting thing, if you didn't think, if you think, well, oh, he just wanted to make the temple just right for God, and that's the reason he did all this stuff, guess what? When he built his castle or his palace after the temple, it took him 12 years. He spent more time building his palace than he did the temple of the Lord. And so I would suggest to you that he was a guy, and he kind of got stuck in the building bug. So what I want to do is I want to pass this around. This is probably, if you've built anything, um, this is probably the most um, versatile tool in your toolbox, the Sawzall. You, you could probably use this as a screwdriver. You can cut metal. You can cut wood. Uh, oftentimes, you're not careful. You'll cut electrical cords. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. So I want to pass this around, and I just want you to feel it. Just, just look at it. Feel it. Get, get an idea of the power that's behind a proper tool, a tool that is used for a purpose. So I'm, I'm going to go on, but just keep passing that around. Look at it, feel it. Think about that, okay? So backing up into the text again, I one of the things I want to look at is let's think about the dimensions, okay? Another building term. The dimensions of God's love. How wide and tall and high and deep is the love of Christ? Think about this. I don't know if he intended anything specific when he gave these, these types of dimensions, but it could be how, how wide 
is God's love. Does it cover all of us? Yeah. Does it, does it cover every sin? D does it cover every need? Does it cover every need? That's how wide his love is. What, what's next? The long. How long is his love? Well, we know from Scripture that God's love is eternal. It's never ending. Um, how high is it? Well, think of, think of the, the depth of, uh, or, or the height of, of his victory, his praise. You stand on the mountaintop. It's as high as the highest heights because God is victorious over everything. And then how deep is it? How deep is God's love? What is the depth? How far will he go to love us? And, and I think the answer is it's unfathomable because he went so far that he died as a human. The creator of humanity died as a human at the hands of humans because he loved us. After he gives the dimensions of God's love, what does he say? He wants us to grasp how high and tall, uh, uh, how high and long and wide and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love which surpasses knowledge. How can you know something that surpasses knowledge? Isn't that kind of an oxymoron? But he's talking about love here. He is saying he wants you to know it even though it's unknowable because I believe he wants you to experience it. When a wife tells a husband she loves him and he says, I know, it doesn't mean he read a book about it. It doesn't mean he knows it because it says so on their marriage certificate. When he says he knows her love, he's saying he knows it because he's felt it, right? He's felt it. So when God says he wants us to know a love that's unknowable, he says you can't know what it means to love. You can't calculate it on a calculator. You can't understand it in a science book. But you can't experience it because he says we can know the love that's unknowable. Next, God's love was meant to be experienced in a community of faith, together. He says, I pray that you may have power together with all the saints to know this love. So, uh, I would argue that um, if you're trying to do life alone, if you're trying to do your faith alone, and, and a lot of people try to do this, if you're trying to do your faith alone, you may never experience the power and love of God. Because God said in the very beginning, it is not good for man to be alone. Over and over and over, he repeats the importance of relationships in the Bible. And right here, he tells us, together with all the saints or together with God's people is how we will know this love. Did I mention that we have small groups that meet during the week? <laughs> it's a good way to connect with others to experience God's love. And, and I can tell you that we experience it. I think people in this room who come to these groups can tell you that we experience that type of life, that we get honest and we share things that you might not see or share or talk about in church on Sunday morning. And we come together and we pray for each other when we have needs. And, you know, Lloyd's about to go through some more surgery uh, on his foot. And, and guess what? We've been able as a small group, multiple small groups to come together and put our hands on him and pray for him and what God is going to do in his life, not just for who he will become, not just for, for uh, a successful medical procedure, but also for the peace. And so I, I would argue that Lloyd would tell you that when we experience that kind of prayer from our community of faith, we experience that love. Next, to experience God's love and power is to experience the fullness of God. The very end of verse 19, after it says, to know his love that surpasses knowledge, it says, that you be... So to know this love, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So if we experience this kind of love and this kind of power by His Spirit dwelling in our hearts through faith, we can experience 
the fullness of God. Who in here would like to experience the fullness of God? And, and some of you may or may not raise your hands. Most people raise your hands. But I think the reality is even people who aren't here, but even people you know who aren't here this morning would probably say, I would give up a lot. I would give up financial freedom. I would give up health. I would give up a lot of things if I knew God's presence with me. If he wo walked in my room and, and he spoke to me. If, if he took me away like, like Isaiah or like John and, and, and transported me from my human body to get a heavenly vision. If I could have that, I would give up a lot. We were created to experience the fullness of God. And while most of us will never experience that, the fullness, the absolute fullness, while most of us may never get quite there, God created that need in us so that we would always long to have his fullness. How many of us really experience that? A lot of people raise their hands, they want to, but how many of us really experience that? Maybe a few hands go up. And, and maybe we think we should say yes. But most of us are somewhere on the path, but we don't quite get there. And wherever we are on the path, we would like to have more of God's presence in our lives. I, I know I would. If that path looks like this, I feel like I'm down here, and I want to be over here. And I wish I could skip to here, but there's a lot that has to change in my life. There's a lot of sacrifices I have to make to get there. But oh, wouldn't it be worth it to be in that place? To experience this fullness of God, we must pray. If you want a relationship with someone... You have to talk to them. But if you do all the talking, it's not much of a relationship, is it? You remember in the video, I love it at the end, he gets through all his laundry list of stuff and he says, Jesus starts to speak and respond, and he goes, oh, look at the time, got to go. That's like our prayers. We give him our, our laundry list, our to-do list, and then we've got to run, do we not? Finally, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Most people quote it this way. See if you can tell the difference. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. Do you notice I threw the can in there? Most of us, if we ever quote this verse, we say can. And while there may be some theological truth to say he can do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, Paul didn't write can in there. And if we read it without the can, it's a different meaning. We're not talking about how powerful God is, that he's beyond anything we can think. All it's saying very specifically here is that God can do immeasurably more than all we can ask. Not all we can ask, but all we ask. He may be able to do all more, more than we can ask, but that's not what he's saying. And I believe part of what he's saying right here is that we're not asking. I think what he's saying is we have such feeble, small faith that we're really not asking God big things and he wants us to come to him Believing that he cares about the small things and he has the power over the big things and that he can do immeasurably more than all the small junk we do ask or all the things that we don't ask. So, I challenge you to ask. James 4, second part of verse 2 and 3 says, You have not because you ask not. And when you ask and do not receive, it's because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend all you get on yourself. God says, ask. I'll do more than all the stuff you ask if you'll just ask and ask with right motives. So where's my, my tool here? I want to drive this, this home just a little bit. Um, Austin, if you come up here, I need some help. Um, 
I want to use the tool as a bit of an illustration of how all this works. I'm loading the blade back in now. I'm going to do what most of us do with God. If I keep going, I will make progress. But God said he had power for us. And if we will plug in to the power source, and man, I hope this thing's charged or this is going to really go bad. <laughs> if we will plug into the power source, he offers us great power to do his work. That could have worked a whole lot better. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I charged it overnight and it seemed to not work. All right, you can take that away. Was there two batteries in the car? Oh, go get the other one, Austin. So, <laughs> I did charge one overnight. Um, that could have been stronger illustration if, if the power had really worked, but maybe the illustration works better that way. Maybe even when we really try to tap in to his power, we only do it as much as is comfortable. And so sometimes we work on it on our own without his power. And sometimes we find that there's a little bit of power, but God wants something so much more. He wants to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning that we have the power available to us if we will only seek you in prayer. God, as we leave this place, I pray that each person here would be challenged if nothing else came through this morning, I pray, God, that we would be challenged to live a different life that has love in it that we do not experience and that most of the time we don't even realize is possible and that there is power available to us if we will just connect with you and spend time in our relationship with you, that we will seek it and we'll seek to use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's see if this works. Let's see if I actually did it right. That is what God wants for us. The battery was there. It was in my car. The right one was in my car. But you know what? It didn't do me any good and my car did it. God says we have the power that he used to raise Christ from the dead available to us. But unless we use it, unless we plug into it, it doesn't help us.